Can you hear me, mother? Then my mother knows it's me. When I shout, can you hear me, mother? Then my mother's pleased, you see. That voice? Oh, what's me? Oh, what's this? What? Genuine antique Sandy Powell records, 5p each. Well, now there's a nice thing. And you know, in the 1935, I was top of the hit parade, selling millions of these records. And look where they finished up on an antique stall. I had a, mind you, there's one thing. It does prove that some things haven't changed. Now, we used to sell these for a shilling each, and nowadays they're exactly the same price, 5p. <laughs> but we have kept down inflation. <laughs> oh, I've had enough of that. Come on. <laughs> Thank you kindly, ladies and gentlemen. I, I know a lot of you people in the audience are nudging each other and saying, is he still alive? <laughs> you know, I, I've been in show business so long, I'm, get, I'm getting so old. I can remember Emmerdale Farm when it was an allotment. <laughs> We've all got to get old. I must, uh, I must tell you a, a story about an old friend of mine, a man of 83, 83, wonderful 83, and he was going to marry a young lady of 22. So he said, what do you, I, I said, uh, well, I said, this is a terrible thing you're taking on. I said, you're 83 and uh, this lady's 22. I said, now you take my advice, go and see the doctor. I said, you see the doctor and get proper advice. Well, he took my, he went to see the doctor. The doctor said, am I, am I right that you're 83 and you're going to marry a lady of 22? He said, yes. He said, well, I, I must be honest with you. He said, he said, this could prove fatal. So the old chap said, well, if she dies, she dies. <laughs> I was born in uh, Rotherham, in uh, Yorkshire, in 1900, so I'm the same age as the year. So now you've got that worked out. But what I... <laughs> I was born in what is called, and it's still there, Russum's Yard. There was a little house at the back of an ironmonger's shop, the smallest house in Rotherham. One up, one out down, and that's where I was born. And then later on, when we did get on a little bit, I can remember my mother saying to me, half jokingly, she said, Sandy, you were born in the smallest house in Rotherham. She said, but me, your mother, she said, I was born in the largest house in Rotherham, the workhouse. <laughs> <laughs> and that is perfectly true, ladies and gentlemen. Well, soon after I was born, my mother and father, the marriage broke up thing that never happens these days. <laughs> they, they parted, my mother had to look after me, and she got a lovely voice, my mother, and got a job at the local pubs and the local clubs round Rotherham and Sheffield. And there she was, singing every night, waiting on in between. Well, after a time, we, she did uh, quite well in the pubs, but she said, I must get away from Rotherham. I've done so much of it. And she got into Sin of Variety. 
Now, in case anyone here, if you don't know what cine variety is, in those days they had, it was when the pictures first started, so I'm going back a long time, they showed a silent film, about 20 minutes, half an hour, and then the engine got hot, so they had to stop and cool the engine down <laughs> before the show continued, you see. Now, for the break in between, they had variety turns. And uh, you, were, you were not wanted, really. They used to call us lantern coolers. <laughs> <laughs> now, by this time, I started doing my own little turn. I, I had a very nice voice. I was a boy soprano. I know you wouldn't think so now with this gravel noise that I make, but I was a boy soprano, sang all the popular songs of the day, and wherever we were, my mother was very clever. If we were in Scotland, she used to dress me in the Scottish kilts, you see, and there, there I am, there I am. There's Harry Lauder was my opposition. <laughs> Another great favourite of mine, a fine comedian. I wonder if you remember him, Harry Tate. Do you remember Harry Tate? <laughs> you do? Yes. You're as old as I am. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's a little bit. Here's a film clip of Harry. Send that to China, will you? Oh, yes, sir. There was a man called about the income tax. He said he wants 200 pounds. Tell him the subscription's too high. I'm not going to join. Hello? I want one, one, double one, and let me let one, please. Hello? Is that the butcher? I want 500 tons of sausages. Have you had any breakfast? Oh, no, sir. Make it six. <laughs> By the way, are your sausages straight? Oh, they're not. <laughs> but cancel the order. Thank you. What's the day, Yes, sir. Good. Now, about this time, I turned to comedy and I, I developed a little act of my own doing impressions of all my favourite comics, you see. And the manager of the theatre my mother was working, he said, I've, uh, I've just seen your little boy, he said, doing impressions. He said, they're all right. He said, now, there's an audition in the morning for a juvenile review. Why don't you let him have a go? So up we went. I remember it was the Cinema Benwell in Newcastle on Tyne. Well, I went up there. I did my little act, you see, and the man running the show, he said, uh, he said, I'll, I'll book you for the, uh, for the juvenile review. I'll book you. He said, but you must decide on a style. He said, now you've been copying all these various star comedians. He said, but of course, everybody does. He said, modern stars, the old ones, they all started by planning their style on somebody. He said, now, who do you like the best? I said, Harry Weldon. He said, right, plan your work on Harry Weldon, which I did. And he said, in the time, he said, you'll develop your own personality like all the others have done. Well, then we, we started, my mother and I, we started our double act called Lily and Sandy. That's me. I was, I was only 14. Look at me. <laughs> then we, uh, we got a week at the old Hippodrome Chesterfield. Uh, this is another true story. At the top of the bill, at the swanky theatre there, they called it the Corporation Theatre, there was Scott and Whaley a great American comedy act. Wonderful artists they were. Anyway, they came and saw a little bit of our show at the Hippodrome. And they sent a note round to my mother that said, will you come and see us in the morning at our theatre? We went over there and they said, have you ever worked in London? Well, we, we'd heard about London. I said, what? No. I said, no, there's no chance of that. I said, we work mostly in Rotherham and Sheffield. He said, 
Would you like us to give you a letter of introduction to our London agent? Which they very kindly did. So we went to London. Or at least we were going to London. But what about the fare? How do we get there? No money. Then my mother had an idea. There was a competition at the old Tivoli Theatre in Sheffield, vanished 50 years ago. And we went into this competition. We won the second prize, two pounds, and we got our fare and our expenses to London. Went to see this big London agent with this letter from Scott and Whaley. And the agent, he said, yes. He said, I'll, I'll fix you a trial week. I'll, I'll get you one week and see how you do. Come in in the morning and I'll give you the contract. So, of course, we were all <laughs> thrilled. Went in the next morning, the agent said, well, there, young man, there's your contract for next week. I said, where is it for? <clears throat> he said, the Hippodrome Rotherham. <laughs> Now, the next important thing that happened, we were still doing our little dub light, Lily and Sandy, and we were at the City Varieties Leeds. It was a very famous music hall in those days. You know, that's where the, you know, the good old days, you know, the show, don't you? Well, <clears throat> we were working there as Lily and Sandy. On the Wednesday or the Thursday night, the manager of the theater came round he said, uh, Sandy, he said, uh, we Georgie Wood, now, we Georgie Wood was a very, you remember him, don't you? Yes. He was a very, very great star, billed, you know, with just the few outstanding ones. He was top of the bill at the Empire Dewsbury. He said, when you've finished your act here, he said, we're arranging a motor car for you to take you to Dewsbury. Georgie Wood is off and they want you to deputise. Well, over we went to Dewsbury and uh, we, we did all right. And there happened to be a very important agent in front from London, Bert Montague. He sent a note round, please come and see me in the morning at the Queen's Hotel in Leeds. I got the full tour then it was glorious for me as a kid to work on the same bills and meet the great artists of the day. People like Mari Lloyd. Mari Lloyd. There she is. A wonderful lady. If you fancy it, that's understood. And suppose it makes you fat, I don't worry over that. Cause the little of what you fancy does you good. <laughs> there you go. Okay. And then another great performer that I had the pleasure of working with, Little Titch. Now, if you don't, you, do you remember him? Oh, you are an old lot in here. <laughs> Any minute now, any minute, a couple of those, that's it. <laughs> now watch this bit. Ah, <laughs> uh, what, what artists they were. And then, of course, maybe the greatest musical artist I've ever seen in my life, and we were very, very close friends, Hetty King. You remember Hetty King, the uh, male impersonator? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See, watch her roll a cigarette.
Sí, yo sé, José Luis. Then, Fred Carnell, probably the greatest genius of all of musical. He was really a genius. He started as an acrobat, then he made a fortune on the musicals, then took this place, Tags Island, called it the Casino, thought he was going to make another fortune, and all the money he made, he was a very rich man, all the money he made, he lost. Oh, he was, he was a great fella. But a wicked, a vicious sense of humor. They put on a show, one of Carnot's shows, at Old Collins Music Hall in London, and Fred Carnot had found what he thought was a new star comedian. Put him in this show, they went to Collins's, they opened, you say, and the comic, poor little devil, he wasn't doing it at all well. Fred Carnot was standing in the wings, <coughs> and the young fellow went to Fred Carnot, he said, Oh, Mr. Carno, I do feel funny. He said, well, for God's sake, get on there as quick as you can. <laughs> now, of all the music hall great acts, <clears throat> you know, there, was, there were certain acts that were never famous as top of the bills and big stars and in the very, very big money, but were popular. Now, that act, to me, was Wilson, Keplin, Betty. You've heard that name, haven't you? There's Betty. She, she was doing that in those days. <laughs> this was the famous sand dance, do you remember? Mind if I <coughs> will you talk among yourselves? <laughs> no, this is hard work. Well, this is the better than the one I've got at the digs. So. <laughs> now then, we come to another male impersonator, Ella Shields. You all remember Ella Shields and her famous song. I ride at ten thirty and sauntered along like a top. Another great music hall artist that I saw as a little boy, 1910. She was principal boy at the Grand Theatre in Glasgow. A beautiful looking woman, a real honest. <laughs> oh, what artist. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about pantomime. Now, my first pantomime was at the old Rotunda in Liverpool. I was playing in Cinderella there. I was one of the broker's men. I think that was 1915, 16. Since then, I've done over 54 pantomimes. <laughs> uh, now, I put on my own pantomime, I thought, 
Why should the management get all the money? I'll put my own on and get a few bob myself. Well, I put this show on, this pantomime, and for the end of the first half, it's got to be important and good, you see, the end of the first half, and I engaged, I saw an act, I forget his name, but it was somebody's canary choir. A lot of little, <laughs> lot of little canaries, unless they were disguised, but they were there all the long day, you see. I thought that'll be a marvellous thing, and the music used to play Monastery Garden or something. <laughs> and these little things, these little things would join in, and yes, yes, <clears throat> that's what he told me when I booked him. <laughs> Well, I had all these little canaries. I thought, now, to make it a real big first-half finale, we'll do the thing properly. So I engaged the uh, Dancing Waters. You've seen them, haven't you, these days? You know, all that. <laughs> See, well, that's what I expected. Anyway, <laughs> here are the canaries, the orchestra down there. They're singing, of course, nobody heard a word. But... <laughs> they switched on the fountains, but instead of going up, <laughs> they came down <laughs> all over the orchestra. <laughs> you can imagine all the trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> but that's absolutely true. Oh, now, let's get to broadcasting. My first broadcast was from Blackpool, 1928. I was doing a summer show there. Then they booked me Savoy Hill, 1920. I thought, oh, I'm in, you see. And I did a lot of music halls from there. And my first sketch I did, I don't know if you remember it, was called The Lost Policeman. I, you do? Yeah. And it, it sounded like this. You know, I've been on my beat all day. I haven't had one case yet. Not one case. Hello, here's a little boy coming along. I wonder what he wants. Hello, Sam, what's the matter? Can you tell me where I can find the policeman, please? I think not. Can you tell me where I can find the policeman, please? What do you think I am, a sea lion or something? Why, what do you want a policeman for? Our Herbert's fell in the river. Your Herbert's fell in the river? Oh, I am sorry, really, I am. Your Herbert's fell in the river, eh? Yes. Oh, it is a shame. Has he, uh, has he been in the river very long? Oh, no, just now. Just now? Yes. Oh, well, that isn't so bad, then. He, he'll get used to it when he's been in a bit, you know. <laughs> has he ever been in a river before? No. Oh, well, it'll be a change for him, then. Can your Herbert swim? No. Oh, well, now's his chance to learn, then. Well, I'll take a few particulars down, well, if you don't mind. It's all right, now. I'm doing my best, now. I'm going to take it all down. Let you do a little secret. The little girl in that photograph is my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> she is now a grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now records. I've tried everything. I did my first record in 1929. 29. And uh, there again, the, the, the fellow said, he said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I can't sing. He said, well, do a little. He said, what are you doing? He said, you're at the Palladium, aren't you? Said, I said, yeah. He said, do the thing you're doing at the Palladium. So I did it, the lost policeman. So I said, uh, what about the, uh, <laughs> the Rock of Ages? You know, the, <laughs> the wages. Oh, he said, uh, he said, well, now we'll give you 60 pounds and we have the entire rights of the record. You don't receive any more. We'll give you 60 pounds. Or you can have 30 pounds recording fee <coughs> and a halfpenny aside. That's a penny a record for all that are sold. I said, well, I'll take the 30 pounds and the, uh, you know, the royalty. Well, we went away to South Africa, away for three months, came back. Bill Hansen came to see me and he said, I've got some good news for you, Sandy. 
Here's a check. Give me a check. 175 pounds. I said, well, I said, what, what is this for? He said, that's your royalties for one month for the lost policeman. And he said, Christmas is coming on. And he said, I think you're going to do very well. Well, that sold just under a million copies, see? Now, altogether, over the years, I sold a million a year, and, uh, and I've been trying to work it out. I ask everybody I know, a penny a record, seven million pennies. Now, if you, you wait till you get home. If, like <laughs> if anybody can tell me where all that money is, I should be delighted. <laughs> The one thing I'm not in love with, I love my business, I love show business, but the clubs. <laughs> I'm no good at the clubs. I, I don't fit and I never feel happy at the clubs. And you know, that I work a few of them and some of them are very, very nice. But others, they want it very rough, very broad and a bit of uh, language thrown in, you see. So I don't do them. <clears throat> now, a friend of mine told me this, and he swears it's true, and I quite believe it. They work in a club up in the north somewhere, a really rough one, you see. One or two, this, this, the secretary went on, ladies and gentlemen, our first act for tonight. Oh, the act came on, got the bird, they were throwing cigarette ends, chocolates, and an uproar and cat calls and everything. The next turn went on, that was the same. The next turn went on, that was the same. Well, it was getting near Alec's turn, you see. Alec Monroe, I'm talking about, the Scotch comedian. Alec sat in there and he said to this compare fella, he said, uh, <coughs> he said, when I go on, he said, I'd like to tell you what I'd like you to say before you introduce me. He said, oh, he said, I'm not going on there again. So Alex said, what do you mean, you know? No, he said, he said, they're throwing things now. He said, you don't expect me to go on there and announce anybody else. So Alex said, listen, if you don't introduce me and go on there and introduce me, I'm not going on at all to do my act. So the fellow said, oh, all right. Well, he came to Alex's turn. <coughs> now, there's the proscenium. There, there's the audience. So this fellow, he said, I'll introduce you. Rushed on, he said, here's another one. <coughs> <laughs> it's nice, isn't it? <laughs> Now, I'd like to talk about a very dear friend of mine, Rob Wilton. Now, ah, oh, you remember old Rob, of course. Well, his catchphrase, the day war broke out. That, that'll never die, you see. And he didn't mean it, it was only just happened. Anyway, uh, when the music halls began to close, I said to Rob, I said, Rob, is it true? I said, I said, the music halls, are really closing down. Is it the red light for us? And Rob said, well, he said, I can tell you this. He said, Moss Empires. Now, Moss Empires controlled nearly all the theatres in Great Britain, between 50 and 60 theatres. He said, Moss Empires, the business is so bad, they're going to close the Swansea Empire, and if it's a success, they're going to close all the others. <laughs> Well, now, I did, I did a few films, you know. Here, here's one of them. Here all the all say no. Eight all so ball pay no. It's a long time remembered from January to December. So here all the all say no. Eight all so ball pay no. And if ever thou does summon for note, always do it for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, we come to the summer shows now. Now, I've done Blackpool, I've done the Isle of Man. Eventually, I took over the, uh, the Pier, the Pier Theatre at Eastbourne. 
Now they had all the lists of all the comics and the stars in the various shows. One of the great national newspapers said Sandy Powell, Eastbourne. He may be all right for Blackpool, Southport, Scarborough, Bridlington, the Isle of Man, or even Brighton, but never, never for Eastbourne. That was before we started, I thought, well, that's a jolly welcome. Anyway, thank God the show went well and everything was all right and we stayed at the pier for 20 years. So it was enough. <laughs> Now, we were talking about summer shows. We went on and on at Eastbourne. It was most glorious. Well, that was our living, really. 22 weeks every summer. And then January the 7th, 1970, tragedy. Our pier theater was burnt down. We lived just opposite the pier. There we saw our living just going up in flames. And I said to Kay, I said, now, what are we going to do? I said, I'm 70. I said, we've done everything. And uh, I said, it looks like as if we've uh, got to pack it up. And then everything good happened. You know how things do go in cycles. First of all, uh, one of the big brewery firms wrote to me. They said, we want to name a pub after you in Rotherham. We want to call it The Comedian. Well, that was, that was a great thrill, and it's there. There's the inside of the pub. Now, the Royal Command Show, that was uh, 1970. That was through a young lady called Mary Hopkins falling out, and they said, well, the youngster's fallen out of the show. Let's get one of the oldens, and that's what happened. Then the same year, I was the subject in uh, This Is Your Life. Now we've had some very, very happy times. And I'm now booking in my date book. It looks so damn silly. It's February the 25th, 1980. So by that time, if I stay the course, I shall be 80 years old. So, <laughs> You know, wherever I go, you know, they, I try out new things. Wherever I go, they say, oh, you must do the ventriloquist. They always want the old ventriloquist. Have you seen it? <laughs> That's it. Now tell me, tell me, my little man, how are you this evening? <laughs> in a minute. <laughs> <coughs> he says he's very well. <laughs> so you're very well, are you? <laughs> and tell me, have you any brothers and sisters? I've got three brothers and three sisters. Here, I say, I saw your lips move there. You mind your own business. Well, I did. I was only standing. Yes, My down there. It was flesh and blood. Now, don't. Don't interfere, please. Every man to his own trade. I'm talking to my little friend. Now, tell me, Sonny, was your father a soldier? Oh, no. He was a little soldier. <laughs> yes, I don't eat meat either. And when he joined the army, have it long I said, I don't eat meat either. Meat? No. We're not talking about meat. We're talking about his father. Oh, oh no. Well, he says his father was a vegetarian. No, no, what he said. <laughs> no. I was here and I can prove it. What? Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> I think I've given the game away. <laughs> no, he, uh, he said his father was a Presbyterian. Oh, <laughs> did he? I'm nearer to him than you are. <laughs> Well, what's the difference between a vegetarian and a Presbyterian? Well, a vegetarian, of course, they don't eat meat. No. But his father, a Presbyterian, that's his belief. Oh, I see. see. And what are you? I'm a ventriloquist. <laughs> that's your belief. <laughs> She's a funny woman. She'll have to go. <laughs> now, tell me, 
Are you going to sing for the ladies and gentlemen? I say, will he sing anything by request? Oh, he'd sing anything by request. Will he? As long as I know it, he'll sing it. <laughs> yes. Well, will he sing something for me? For you, certainly. Oh, good. Yes. Out of Mary Poppins. Yes. You know the one. <laughs> Super califragilistic ex maila <laughs> If he does, he'll sing it by himself. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell me. What are you going to sing for the ladies and gentlemen? And go kicking the sand and drink in the sand. What did he say? He said he's only going to sing the sand. I wish I'd have got a bigger moustache. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, before I leave you, I'd like to say a little thing. I've been saying on the wireless for 50 years. Say it with me. Can you hear me, Mother? Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just as a little finale, I'd like to sing, well, I'd like you to sing it with me if you remember it. The very first song I ever sang on the stage long before the First World War. Please join in if you remember. I love you as I never 